This is your very first lecture for Philosophy 220, a study of ethics. And since this is the very first lecture, we'll just be looking at an introduction uh, to ethics or morality uh, in this lecture. Okay, as we take a look at uh, ethics, we need to first realize that it is one of the major branches within philosophical study. You take the word philosophy and you can see that you have two Greek words coming together to form a compound word. Philos means love. Uh, Sophos is uh, wisdom. Sophia, uh, wisdom. And so this is the love of wisdom. But when we think about the study of philosophy in the academy today, we ought best uh, deem it as thinking about thinking, uh, trying to get behind the conclusions that we reach, the decisions that we make, and see if we can discover the process of how we arrived at those conclusions. Thinking about thinking is probably best pictured by Rodin's The Thinker, uh, which you have pictured here on the slide. Uh, many people uh, don't see what ethics has to do with philosophy if philosophy is primarily thinking about thinking. Uh, wouldn't that be more in the realm of metaphysics, which seeks to describe what reality is beyond what uh, science can determine, um, such as the relationship between the visible and the invisible, uh, spirit and matter, and those sort of questions. Or possibly philosophy could be logic. I mean, that truly is thinking about thinking, uh, going through the process of simply connecting uh, the dots on how we uh, arrive at a particular conclusion or answer. But if we think about the way that we determine our convictions about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, we will realize that that also involves a process of reasoning, moral reasoning. And that's what we call ethics. Therefore, the, we reach ethical conclusions through a process that is truly philosophical. Uh, we think our way through what is moral. Okay, there are particular stages in the study of ethics. I know this seems like a bizarre picture that I have on this slide, but there is a purpose behind it, and I'll get to that uh, after giving you a uh, brief definition of each of these four stages. Stage number one is called descriptive ethics, and at this stage uh, we are refraining from making any sort of judgment about what is good or bad or right or wrong. We are simply observing and stating the facts about the moral behavior, the ethical actions in a person's life, or more often an anthropologist will do this in studying a particular culture or society. When we get beyond descriptive ethics, we move into normative ethics. And normative ethics will take those actions that we've just observed in descriptive ethics and examine the rules or laws that dictated that particular behavior. Okay, so first we just observe what the behavior is, and then we identify in normative ethics what the rule or law is behind that action. Okay, we next move into the most theoretical stage of studying ethics. We call this meta-ethics. Meta-ethics theorizes about the thinking processes that were involved in arriving at such a law or rule. So normative ethics gives us the rule or gives us the law. Meta-ethics is going to ask the question, well, how did they arrive at that rule? How did they determine that that was a good law? And then lastly, we will move into applied ethics, which is very practical. Applied ethics uh, will attempt to arc articulate a position concerning uh, right and wrong actions that should be taken in a specific situation. And uh, again, this is what the last half of the semester is going to do. We're going to look at 11 ethical issues and uh, seek to take the theory that we learned in the first half and then apply it uh, to those ethical issues. Okay, now let's get to the picture, which will help us uh, have a good concrete example of what's going on at all four of these stages. Okay. In Indian culture, Hindu culture, it used to be a common practice that when a husband would die, the widow would throw herself into the fire of his funeral pyre. Um, this practice is no, no longer, it's now outlawed, so this is no longer practiced, but it's going to give us a good example of all four stages of studying ethics. First of all, for an anthropologist, we simply observe that this takes place. Uh, 
It may horrify us, but we refrain from making judgment in descriptive ethics. We just simply see that in this particular culture, when a husband dies, it's common to see the widow throw herself, uh, uh, sacrifice herself on the flames of her husband's funeral pyre. Okay, normative ethics is going to move in, try to discover what the rule or law is and behind this uh, behavior. And we discover that in the Hindu culture, once a husband dies, at one point, again, no longer, not present day, but at one point, uh, the widow, the woman's life, was considered to have lost all of its value. And since she no longer has value without a husband, uh, she sacrifices uh, her life. Uh, he is being made into ashes to be reincarnated, and she wants to join him in that process for her own reincarnation. And meta-ethics uh, certainly will ask, well, how do we arrive at such a rule in law? And I've already answered that question for us. We discover that within this culture, the rule or law to throw herself onto the, onto the flames of the funeral pyre is there because she is deemed to have less value and maybe no value after her husband has died. And so, again, that's meta-ethics. That is the thinking that's behind the law. Now, as we move into applied ethics, we can see how this has now changed uh, today. And again, this is now outlawed in India. Uh, even though uh, it's still a patriarchal culture and women are not understood to be as valuable as men, the applied ethic has changed to say that women still have considerable value even without a husband. And so to uh, commit suicide, to throw oneself onto the flames of the husband's funeral pyre, uh, is now seen as an unethical action because your life is still considered to have value and uh, should be lived according to the moral norms that have now changed. Okay, so that gives us a concrete example of what's going on with all four stages here. Okay, we also need to talk about the terms value or values and obligation. Uh, oftentimes, when uh, using moral reasoning, we'll draw a conclusion about a person or an action, uh, whether he is good or bad, uh, whether she is kind or mean-spirited. And when we do this, we assign value to that person or action. Uh, for example, he was kind. Okay, That's a value word implying goodness. He was kind to open the door for the man on crutches. But along with value, we also need to discuss obligation. Uh, obligation um, involves the word should. Um, should an action be taken, or should an action not be taken? And so we'll use the same example here. Uh, he did what he should, okay, that's an obligation word, not a value word. He did what he should when he opened the door for the man on crutches. In other words, it's, it's not just a kind thing, it's not just a good thing, a thing of value, but knowing how difficult it would be to open a door when one is on crutches, there is a societal obligation that one should uh, do that. Okay, then when we move into ethical value, we need to understand that this value can be either intrinsic or extrin extrinsic. Uh, intrinsic value is inherent. Uh, extrinsic value is derived. And the best way to understand the difference between the two is through an example. Uh, CPR is extrinsically valuable because it can be used to save a human life, which has intrinsic value. Okay, so CPR then is not good in and of itself, but it becomes good, okay, it's an extrinsic value, it becomes good when it is used to save a human life, which is considered intrinsically good. Okay, so CPR derives its value from saving a human life, and the human life has inherent value. Uh, by the way, I use CPR as an example because many of you may know that... Uh, I believe it is the majority of states have a law that if one is certified in CPR, you are required to use it if necessary. And so it's not just a good thing to use CPR, but also our other uh, term on this slide, it is an obligation, a legal obligation uh, to use that skill if you have it and it is needed. Okay, there are four factors that make ethics uh, unique. Uh, you need to have a good working understanding of all four of these. Okay, first we have the primacy of reason. When it comes to uh, ethics or, or moral reasoning, we will certainly have feelings about particular ethical issues, but feelings are quite subjective. 
And so reason is considered within the philosophy of ethics to be more important than our feelings. Uh, we, try, we try to be. Now, none of us can be completely objective. But we try to be as objective as possible and use reason when reaching our ethical or moral conclusions. Okay, second, this term is not used in your textbook, the ubiquity principle. Your textbook uses the term uh, universalizability. And that means whatever your ethical conclusion, uh, whatever your uh, moral code that you develop, it needs to be as universal as possible. In other words, it's going to have greater weight, greater authority if it can be practiced uh, everywhere. Um, so in other words, if you're in one location and you determine that an ethical action uh, is good at that place, then it needs to be universal and that when you are at another place, it is hopefully uh, going to be uh, considered the good action there also. Um, if your ethics begin to change, your ethical conclusions change as you move from place to place within the philosophy of ethics, that would be seen as weakening the authority of your ethical conclusion. Uh, same is true of impartiality or egalitarianism. This means equality among people. Uh, you need to make sure that your ethical uh, conclusion would apply equally to individuals. Um, it would be very, very unethical for me to accept money under the table from a student and give that student an A, whereas uh, another student uh, is not giving me money under the table. And even though they may have done well in the class, I decide to give them an F because they didn't give me money. That would be a very, very unethical thing of me to do because that would be showing partiality or showing favoritism. And then fourth, I um, had a little bit of a disagreement with your author here. Uh, I agree that there should be a primacy of moral norms over other norms, such as uh, legal norms, laws, or aesthetic norms, making judgment about the, uh, the, the beauty, artistic beauty, or the value of something. Um, but I don't think it always works out this way. So again, I, I think your author is right to say this is the, the way that it, it should be, that we can come to agreement that a moral norm is more important than a, a legal norm or an aesthetic norm. Uh, but any of you who have ever seen Law and Order or a television show like that know that this is oftentimes not the way uh, things work out, that a law, a legal norm, will oftentimes take precedence over a moral norm. Uh, we can know what actually happened in a situation, but uh, and, and know that um, morally what should take place, but if there is a law in place, uh, it oftentimes will come over uh, the moral norm. Now, what we hopefully see is over time, uh, legal norms are changed to uh, give precedence to the moral norm. And, and, and I do think this is where your author is, is very much correct, that uh, we do see that process over time take place, but in, in present day situations, Oftentimes, a legal norm uh, will come over a moral norm. OK, when it comes to moral reasoning and uh, religion, we come into some complicated territory. The relationship between faith and reason has been a tenuous one for many centuries. Some religious persons think that the philosophy of ethics is unnecessary, arguing that you know, we as a religious people have received a divine revelation. We've received something from God, and therefore we don't need to have any reasoning about it. We don't need to ask any questions about it. Um, this is very much a minority among religious people because the vast majority of religious people uh, think of reason as a gift given by God, and therefore um, reason can certainly uh, be used to help understand one's faith uh, better. And so even though religious persons don't agree necessarily on what the relationship between faith and reason uh, should be, we do see that most religious people do think there should be some sort of relationship between faith and reason and that uh, one doesn't make the other dispensable. And then your textbook does a fine job of demonstrating what the divine command theory is, which is very much against doing the philosophy of ethics. The divine command theory says there's no need to do any reasoning about what is good or bad, right or wrong, that whatever um, the divine figure, whether that's God or some ultimate reality, whatever, it may be given in a book of holy scripture or may be given through a particular religious teacher, that whatever... Uh, God says, or the divine being says, is automatically good. So if the divine being commands the genocide of an entire ethnic group, 
even though we might have uh, cultural standards or even uh, just human empathy would tell us that's bad. The divine command theory says, no, no, if God commanded it, then it's automatically good. So we define good by whatever God commands, and that eliminates the need to do any sort of reasoning uh, through what a moral philosophy or an ethical philosophy uh, might be. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, div divine command theory, if you uh, were to adopt that approach, it would make any sort of need for moral reasoning uh, obsolete.